Hello, and welcome to the Waves webinar series. Today we're going to be covering full-on effects presented by Barry Wood, author of the book Waves Plugins Workshop, Mixing by the Bundle. But before we get started, I'm going to take a minute and go through the format of the webinar for anybody that hasn't done one of these before. My name is Yoni and I'm the moderator. You can't see me, but I'm here working behind the scenes to help make sure everything runs smoothly. The webinar will last about an hour and has two parts to it. The first half will be a presentation from Barry, where he'll walk us through the most common processing used in mixing effects, focusing on the various delays, reverbs, and modulation effects offered in all the Waves bundles. The second half of the webinar will be an open Q&A. Feel free to submit any questions you have, and based on how much time there is, we'll try and answer as many of them as we can get to. You can send your questions in at any time, but you won't see them right away in the chat, as they'll first go to me, and then I'll feed them to Barry one at a time. Keep in mind that there are a lot of people online with us today, so we appreciate your patience while you wait to have your questions answered. I'm going to hand things over now to our presenter for today. He's the author of the book, Waves Plugins Workshop, Mixing by the Bundle, which provides an informative overview of the Waves plugins used in mixing studios the world over. Each chapter covers a wide variety of plugins, includes valuable tips and tricks that will enhance your productions, and offer real-world, hands-on experience through downloadable audio files and plugin presets that let you actually hear the power of these tools. Today you're in for a treat as you're going to get an up-close look at the wealth of information presented in the book. So please welcome the author of Mixing by the Bundle, Barry Wood. Hi, I'm Barry Wood. Um, tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been a professional engineer, audio engineer for nearly 30 years. Uh, I recorded, mixed, and or mastered over 400 albums. Uh, I've been the technical editor on uh, seven different books about audio, and I'm also the author of a book called Waves Plugin Workshop, Mixing by the Bundle. Um, this book uh, covers pretty much all, well, it covers all the Waves plugins from, uh, at least it was written just when version 8 came out. Uh, I produced a song, and over the course of the book, as I introduce each plugin, I um, describe the plugin, and then I show how I used it in a particular mix. Uh, so I produce tracks, and as you go through the book, through more progressively uh, complete bundles, uh, it shows how all the plugins integrate into that same mix. <clears throat> um, for this webinar, I'll be using the, that track that I produced for the book. Um, this is going to be my last webinar in the series. Um, the first two I did, I did one on equalization, another one on compression. This, uh, this webinar is going to cover effects. Um, I'll pretty much cover everything that's in there. Uh, I'm not going to use any of the uh, artist series or the one knob plugins because uh, they're pretty abstract and not very good candidates for learning how you know, the processing, various processing works. Um, the, uh, this is a list of all the plugins by bundle. This is uh, one of the charts I produced for the book. Um, so I'll be running through each of these guys and uh, you know, give a spin through each plugin and uh, when I get done showing you all the plugins, I'll be uh, bringing up, uh, you know, taking questions and seeing what I can do. Um, so first of all, um, one of the things about the the plugins, when you insert a plugin, this is going to be platform dependent. But uh, if you have a mono track, you'll have both um, mono and stereo plugins and some hosts like if you see here it might be a little bit small but there's a it'll show you show you a mono version a stereo version and then sometimes there's a, a mono to stereo version and I found that the the stereo versions are often pr uh, provided by the host and they are really just kind of dual mono it just takes a you know sums the signal and processes it uh, the monitor stereo instances actually waves his, you know, some of the plugins have additional like pan controls or things where they're doing the monitor stereo conversion themselves. So I just make sure whenever I'm doing a monitor stereo, I always use that particular uh, instance of the plugin. 
Um, the first plugin I'm going to go over is uh, Mondo Mod. It's not um, it's not one you hear a lot about, but it's a it's a really interesting plugin. Uh, I've got it on the electric piano on the intro of this this tune. Let me play a little bit of that. So here's Mondo Mod. This is a. Um, let me play you some of the electric piano without that, and then with it. So I'm using that Mondo Mod to give it that kind of you know tremolo panning thing that's uh, pretty common with uh, you know Fender Rhodes. Uh, electric pianos. Um, uh, the reason I'm covering Mondo Mod first is it it does a um, it, it's a great introduction to to phase and as it relates to processing. Um, let me, uh, when uh, phase often phase is discussed as far as phase relationship between two signals in a stereo field it might um, you know, you can have phase problems with things out of phase, but really at, at its base, it just describes a relationship be, in phase. So you can see here, this first um, first one is showing one cycle of a waveform at zero degrees at just normal phase. If you delay that a quarter of the period of the, the waveform, then it becomes, it's at 90 degrees. When you get halfway through, it's 180 three quarters to 270. Um, with effects, it can represent, you know, if you have a modulation, you have uh, like a low frequency oscillator modulating some parameter, you can, uh, monomod in particular, allows you to change the phase of that. So you can have one thing at a different period in the modulation from another one. So if you have 180 degrees out of phase, you've got one thing going up as the other goes down. Um, so if you see here, MonoMod has uh, amplitude depth and frequency modulation depth. So the amplitude modulation, if I just play that, that's giving you the um, that kind of wavering, the volume going up and down. And I've got a, just a little bit of frequency modulation to give it Actually, I got the stereo on too. So that gives it just a little bit of a, you know, pitch waver. This is giving it the pan left and right, the center section. And then the amplitude gives it that kind of volume up and down. And you see the, um, the, I've got the FM at 90 degrees and the amplitude modulation at 270. So those are kind of opposite of each other and both offset slightly from the panning. So it, if they were all in sync, you would end up with it panning, the pitch, and the amplitude happening at both ends of the, uh, of the sweep, which is a lot, a lot less in interesting. Um, this one I found kind of gave you that a little bit of a Doppler thing with the pitch going on and the amplitude giving that tremolo sound. Um, and, you know, another important thing in, in effects is uh, is the rate. Like right now, this this project in particular wasn't recorded to a click, uh, except for the sec the center section has some loops, so that's locked down to a, a tempo, but the rest isn't. So I have got it set for manual uh, sync, so I just specify like 2.42 hertz, um, which in this case would be 145 BPM. Uh, this tune itself, I think, is about 158, so it's not far off. Um, often I'll, I'll uh, sync effects to to the BPM. Uh, sometimes not. Um, it, it can be more interesting to have it, you know, kind of change against the beat. Um, let me see. Next one, let me show you a uh, metaflanger. Yeah, I got that on the... Acoustic.
So I've got a bypass now. So it gives you your um, standard kind of flange sound. Um, you know, you have control over whether the LFO, the, the modulating wave, is a triangle or a sine. A triangle, when it gets to the end, it'll come back quicker. A sine kind of lingers more on, on either, either end. Um, you know, you've got the stereo control. When you have that at zero, everything's summed to the center. As you move out, it gets out to 90, when you get out to 90 degrees, that's at either end of the, the left and right field. Beyond that, it's actually kind of messing with the phase to make it sound wider. Um, you, know, you have to be careful using that because uh, it might not, when you sum to mono, it might not, uh, you might get it disappearing. But if you really need to throw it out to the edge, that works pretty nicely. Uh, you have a depth control uh, delay. You can get it really wobbly. Um, and then the, the mix. Whenever you're using um, an effects plugin in line, uh, typically you have a mix control. You know, it's either wet, dry, or referred to as mix. Zero is normally no effect. 100 is all effect. Um, and with time-based processors like uh, choruses and flangers, you know, you can hear it at 100%, especially if it's stereo. Um, but you often get a little you know, more effect when you, when you do a mix, because you've got the original signal and the flange signal interacting. You know, if you want just a little bit of it. You know, it's a nice thing if you want a track to kind of pop out of the mix a little bit. Adding a little bit of that um, can really do the trick. Um, and let me show you something else on um, on the drums. The uh, more meta flanger. There's uh, something that's kind of cool that... Uh, not... It's easy to miss. There's the drums. Now, in Metaflanger, you've got this tape button. Now, um, all modern workstations now do delay compensation. Uh, you insert a plug in, it tells the host how much time it needs to do its processing, and then the host will feed it the audio that many milliseconds or samples earlier so that when it gets done processing everything is right in sync. Uh, one of the cool things about that is with the tape button, you know, normally you have you know your wet and dry, your dry signals there. The wet signal is going to be delayed. You have the delay setting on the uh, on Metaflanger. But when you do the uh, when you engage tape, it also delays the the dry signal. It's all compensated for later. But the cool thing about that is the, the modulating signal goes um, earlier and later than the original, than the, than the dry signal, which is kind of how the, the original flanging effect was done. You'd have two tape machines, and the flange on the reel, you put your thumb on one and then on the other, so you slow them down so one they alternate being you know, one ahead of the other. Um, so you can get that really cool, especially, okay, this uh, phase button, you see a lot of these have a, have that zero with the slash. That's a polarity invert. Now, if you invert the effect, as it modulates past that zero point, you get that total cancellation. So let me show you what that sounds like here. So it just completely goes away as it passes through that center point. So here's with some stereo. So you can see when it's in stereo, you don't get as dramatic a, an effect. 
you know, because it's got, you know, it, it with everything summed to mono, when it's inverted and you hit that center, it just totally goes away. Um, so that's a that's a pretty cool effect if you want to pull it off, and Metaflanger does a really nice job of that. But I don't think I need that for this mix. Uh, the next plugin, uh, it's actually one of my favorites, um, Enigma. Um, it's kind of a flanger, kind of not, kind of a little bit of everything. It's really kind of a um, you know, chorus and flange construction kit. So on the center section here, I've got Enigma going on the, uh, the lead guitar. So it's kind of doing a, a phase, it sounds kind of like a phaser, but it's real subtle, but it, it adds a nice texture to the to the tune. Now this one you can really kind of go nuts in. I mean, you'll see the, the same kind of, um, you know, modulation controls, um, but you've got control over how many notches you're going to have. You can add a half a notch, you can invert the phase, you can do all sorts of stuff. You can control the frequency range that the um, that the the processing happens on. Uh, how much? Um, you've got uh, it's uh, you've also got uh, control over the feedback. You can how how much. Uh, Decay time, the delay, you can also kind of tailor the frequency of the, uh, the feedback. See, with more feedback, you get that kind of whistling. Um, you know, in general, I'm not a... Yeah, I don't use a lot of presets when I bring up uh, plugins, uh, you know, compressors, uh, definitely EQs. EQs are just so source dependent that I, I never really do that. Effects, on the other hand, there's a lot of interesting um, effects that are... Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the presets give you all sorts of interesting places to start from. Um, you know, and Enigma's kind of different enough that uh, the, the uh, presets are, are really useful uh, for figuring out how it works. But uh, I, I like it because you can get things out of it that you really can't get out of other compressors and phasers and flangers. <laughs> So, uh, let's see. Now, along those lines, Doubler is another, um, uh, that one's designed to kind of make it sound like uh, a track is automatically being been doubled, been recorded twice. Because uh, if you record it twice, you get that mix of the, the two parts, to, you know, the two tracks together, and it's not perfect. So you get kind of natural phasing that happens. Um, and let me see, let me go to the chorus vocal. Um, Never stop asking. Chorus, chorus. Never stop asking. So with uh, Doubler, there's a two voice and a four voice version. But you basically can set up multiple um, little sub-modulators that are, are going to... Um, you can pan and delay, set the level on them, uh, detune, and also have a, a modulation rate 
so you can because uh, if you just do a straight detune it's going to be kind of a static uh, you'll hear kind of a comb static comb filtering sound uh, with a little bit of modulation it, it can sound like it's um, you know multiple voices kind of never stop asking why now here's with some doubling never stop asking why never stop so it has a little bit of that sound like multiple voices going um i would probably use a little less of it never stop asking why yeah just because a little you know it gets pretty obvious when you're um uh, when you use a lot of it um the doubler you know in certain instances can be a a pretty cool plug-in. Um, going on from doubler, ultra pitch is kind of um, even more of a uh, interesting plug-in, let's say. Um, section here. So ultra pitch, um, you get the, the similar kind of layout for the voices. Uh, you can pan them. Uh, you know, the pan is expressed in the position across left and right. Um, the volume up there, these are both up, you know, that one's all the way up at max, that one's up some. Um, you, this is doing, like, a, a doubler allows you to detune, de but it's within a pretty narrow range. Um, so unless, uh, there is an octave control in there, so you can get kind of weird, but this, um, you've got... <laughs> Um, these are both set for unison. So these are the individual effects that are generated. Uh, here's the, the original track. Then the left. And the right. Now, you can hear that there's a different tone on those, even though they're both set to unison. Uh, Ultra Pitch introduces format processing. Now the format represents kind of the spectral quality of, a, of the, the sound. Um, if you take, say, a voice and then just like do like a tape speed thing, you know, speed it up, it ends up sounding kind of chipmunky. The pitch goes way up, the, the everything goes up, and on the same way, when you pitch it down, it gets, you know, real strange sounding. Format adjusting allows you to compensate for that. Most of the uh, the vocal pitch adjustment um, software out there kind of does automatic format adjustment. So if you pitch something up, it actually kind of brightens it up. It changes the the spectral quality of the sound, so it sounds more natural. You get less of the chipmunk effect. In this case, you can actually use that type of effect. You know, it's set for unison, and I've got the format up almost plus two on one and minus 3.6 on the other, or minus two and then plus 3.6. So you can use that to change the quality of the tone. So here's the original. And the unison one up a little bit with its formats. So, and it's not just brighter, it's changed some stuff internally and then lower. So, here's all three. So this is, I'm actually kind of using this as a, a doubler type thing as well. You can use, uh, do uh, change the pitch pretty radically, but you end up with just parallel harmonies. It's, it's hard to build harmonies with this uh, unless you really get into automating these, because uh, it's just going to be a static 
change. Well, that's not going to sound very good if it's... Let me see if I just set them for uh, like a fourth and a fifth. Um, it's kind of a... That's, uh, I've just got the one going a fifth down. I'm adding a fourth up. Uh, you can do some kind of weird and interesting things with that. Uh, now the, um... I should probably bypass that. Um, and Wave's other plugin for changing the pitch is uh, Sound Shifter. Um, there's multiple modes on that if your um, if your DAW supports it. Uh, the main the main function that I've used Sound Shifter for is just overall pitch shifting. Uh, you can take the whole mix and uh, like right now I've put it on the master fader. And uh, if I turn off the solo, um, you can, it, it actually you know, does a pretty good and pretty clean job of changing the, the pitch of an, you know, an entire mix. Uh, it works really great on particular instruments if you need to uh, put something in a different key. Never stop. I mean, it sounds pretty darn good. There aren't a whole lot of artifacts. Uh, it has multiple modes, uh, transient, smooth, and sync, oh, and punch. Um, it controls how it does its processing. Uh, it can, um, you know, if you're more concerned about, like, keeping the sharp transients than the transient mode, um, smooth sacrifices transients a little bit for just a um, kind of a smoother pitch output. Um... This can be used, uh, you know, especially if you if you automate the uh, the pitch, you can do some uh, pretty interesting and creative. Uh... Never stop asking why. Uh, it, that's not something you use every day, but uh, can be a lot of fun. Uh, let me see. Uh, one of my favorite ones. Um, in fact, I think it was probably the first, um, well, Waves were the, the first plugins I ever had back on the Audio Media 2 card with the Sound Designer app. Um, but a little later when uh, SuperTap came out, and it's uh, it's still pretty much, you want any delay? That's kind of the first one I go for. Um, let me look at that on the synth, on the chorus. Um. Running aground by sails all in tatters. Hear the delay going on there. Um, you know, you get that nice familiar uh, pan and volume uh, representation. This is a, a pretty. When I want to throw a delay on something to give it some space. Um, this is a pretty common setting for me. I'll throw just two taps, one left, one right, pull down the gain. Um, and I also tend to use a little modulation. And you got the same kind of controls, controls you see in the other plugins. Um, I've got it set to manual sync and a real slow rate, uh, 0.07 hertz, and a depth of 2.8 milliseconds. So the delays, I've got one set at 192 and the other at 264. So those are going to modulate plus or minus about three milliseconds. So you do get a little bit of that, you know, some subtle chorusing. It makes it uh, just a little more animated. Um, and another thing I often do is use the EQ. You know, you can EQ each of the taps differently. Um, 
fact, here's the, uh, the dry signal. And then here's just the delays. So you can see uh, I'm using that, uh, that bell filter. So it's really emphasizing kind of the mids and not so much the, uh, the high and the low frequencies. Um, sometimes I'll use a, a low pass and just kind of hack off the high end. Sometimes I'll hack off the low end just to give the, uh, the, the delay its own kind of space. If you just leave it full frequency, you know, that sometimes gets a little thick and muddy and uh, you can get more kind of delay sound without mucking up the mix. And I've got, you can see i got the 192 and 264, so I've got them kind of coming a little bit left and right. Um, which also, you know, emphasizes the uh, kind of the stereo sound. So I'll play it for you in the mix, with and without. Well, there's a lot going on, you might, might not be able to hear too much. Running aground by nah, everything's going at that point. Um... Now, Wave's uh, newer delay, the hybrid delay, is um, actually quickly becoming one of my favorites, too. Let me uh, go to the verse. Um, in the verse of the song, I wanted it to be kind of tight and dry, not real... Not real affected. So, but I am actually using the, the delay on the vocals. It's, uh... The more I look and try hard to see... Now, when you hear it soloed, it really becomes apparent that there's delay going on in there. But in the mix, you're not really hearing as much as kind of feeling it. Um, and... So with a uh, hybrid delay, what they've done is is uh, done some modeling of old analog delays. Um, and there's noise, there's distortion, there's you know uh, frequency changes that all contribute to you know an interesting sound for the delay. Uh, they've also added you know you have filters in here, and you can hear on this one I've got you know the uh, delay itself. If I just put it up to a uh, wet. And try hard to see. So, you know, I'm cutting off high end and cutting off low end, just getting that little mid thing. And you can hear it's doing a kind of a left right thing. Uh, the analog control, you've got. The more I look and try hard. It controls the, the character of the, the analog processing, you know, the noise and the other, the other things involved with that. Um, but you've got, you know, you can sync it up, you can do it, run it free, like in this case, 122 milliseconds. Um, I've got it set for ping pong, so it's doing alternating uh, delays left and right. The more I look. At 122 milliseconds, that's pretty quick, so you're not really hearing specific taps. But it's giving that, that kind of left-right bounce back and forth. Uh, and I'm not doing any feedback, so it's just boom, boom, and it's done. So that that keeps that kind of tight and uh, feeling in the in the verse, but let me show you. You should be able to hear with and without. So here's uh, the the verse with everything going with the uh, delay bypassed. Now with it. Oh, <laughs> let me set the. Uh, wet dry mix back properly. So here's without. And with. So you can hear there's just that little bit of delay happening. It gives a, you know, kind of makes the vocal a little more interesting. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, a number of little subtle things uh, can really add up to a, an interesting mix. Uh, 
see, let's get into some reverbs now. Um, the first reverb that, uh, first software reverb I ever used was Waves again. It was the uh, their uh, True Verb. Um, let's see. Let me stick that on uh, at the end of the song. We've got some background vocals. <laughs> In this mix, I actually, all the background vocals, I'm not adding any reverb or anything. Um, but they're typically when they're coming in, there's enough going on. They didn't really need anything. Uh, but uh, they make a pretty good uh, example for this. So. so there they are dry. Now, super or, uh, True Verb does um, kind of space modeling. I mean, you really have um, uh, control over early reflections, uh, reverb tail, frequency, frequency response. Um. That sounds sounds pretty good. And instead of having a wet dry mix, you actually have individual control over the uh, the direct signal, the early reflection, and the reverb levels. Um, so you can dial those in. You can um, you know, change the, uh, the, the room size, kind of adjust the, uh, the early reflections, um, distance shows you how, you know, changes the, the, uh, the decay, decay of those early reflections. It's like, here's just the early reflections. Here's just the reverb. Now, typically, you know, the early reflections are going to be what you hear first, kind of slapping off the walls, you know, the nearby walls, and it kind of gives you a cue for the size of the room. Then the, the reverb is, once it's kind of bouncing around the room, it becomes kind of that mush that decays off. Um, you can get a lot of, uh, you know, you, by changing the frequency response on each of these, those you can do, different things to uh, to make the room sound different. Um, one thing, the time it takes for the, the reverb tail, the, the, the room reverb, to come back and, and for you to hear it is a big cue to the size of the room. It's a huge cathedral, you're going to create some sound, it's going to take a while to kind of bounce around and start coming back. So if you set a big pre-delay, it makes it seem like a larger room. And you can also play with the early reflections. I mean, you would uh, probably um, you know, play with those to get that kind of sound. Um, True reverb is, is pretty good, but you can hear the reverb tails a little bit kind of grainy. Um, you can use this uh, decorrelation a bit, can help. But it's still not not the the prettiest thing for that. Uh, if I do use True Verb, I tend to use it for kind of smaller rooms uh, to give it a little bit of space. Uh, but you know, it, it Waves has got better reverbs, and I haven't used uh, True Verb in a while. Um, you know, for that type of thing, I, I prefer to go to uh, Renaissance Reverb. Now, one thing. There's a couple of ways you can run effects in general. Like in this case, I've got the the back, you know, these background vocals are submixed into an aux channel, and I just put the reverb in line on that channel. Uh, most of the other effects you've seen, I've been using uh, channels, you know, just using inline effects. Uh, another way to do it, especially if you want to share, well, uh, that was one way to share to to submix and then put it in line on the submix. Uh, but if you want to have, you know, use, say, a reverb or something for multiple tracks, uh, setting up as a send is really the way to go. Um, like you can see here, I've got 
uh, the guitar is all sending over to, well, one thing I've, I've labeled uh, plate. Um, and then I've got just a couple of tracks. I've got uh, the melody synth and then the, uh, the chorus vocal going to another send. And so I set up a, an aux track, and that's why I've got a Renaissance reverb on there. Uh, when you're using a, a send, um, a re, uh, an effect, uh, you know, typically choruses, the flangers, you use those in line. Uh, they aren't generally, generally I, I just find it a lot easier to use those in line. Uh, there's not much sense in using sends. Uh, but with reverbs, often I'll want to send a couple of tracks, maybe a few tracks of the same reverb to put them in a similar space, kind of glue it together a bit. Uh, so that's where sends come in nice, come in handy. And also it doesn't require um, you know, multiple instances. Uh, some of the reverb plugins do take some uh, significant resources. So the uh, Renaissance reverb was Wave's next reverb, and I actually like that one quite a bit. Um, let me go back to the top. I've got... Uh, Um, I'm just adding a little bit of a, a reverb to that synth, and I'm using the uh, nonlinear. You know, you've got different uh, reverb types. Um, I'm using the nonlinear. Um, I put on the on the synth just for uh just add a little bit of something to it but i really came up with that one more for the uh for the chorus vocal never stop asking why ne you can hear when it it doesn't have a reverb tail that goes out the non-linear is more of kind of a gated thing it just kind of goes and then stops and I, I went with something like that. I, I wanted kind of a big sound on the vocal, but I didn't want it to just wash out and muck up the whole mix. Uh, so the nonlinear gives you that initial kind of big feeling of the reverb, but it uh, doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't wash it out. So here's me bypass. Actually, I'll have to just mute the. Uh, Get that. Never stop asking why. Now with a reverb. Never stop asking why. Never. So it allows you to, to to make it a little bit wet, make it give it some space, but not make everything kind of just a big wash. Um, now Wave's other reverb, IR1, in fact, let me uh, just do something with the master track here. Um, IR1 is a uh, impulse response reverb. Uh, it's a type of reverb where they actually, you go to an acoustic space, an actual space, put up measuring microphones, run an impulse through the space, record that impulse, then later on analyze it and basically turn that into an algorithm for, uh, for reverb. <laughs> so uh, I've just got this in the master fader. Never stop asking why. Never stop at so with that, the uh, impulse response reverbs, one of the things I really like about those is the, the reverb tails are typically just really beautiful. I mean, they're smooth, that just decays out nicely. Um, you can, uh, like this is a concert hall. There's, uh, you know, different... Uh, there's a room. Studio, which is a pretty 
pretty short reverb. And that's actually a plate, so it's a, a analog plate reverb that they've done the analyzed the uh, the reverb quality on. Uh, you can uh, Waves has uh, impulse responses that you can download if you have IR1 and load up a whole bunch of different ones. Now the IR1 uh, L gives you just some basic controls, uh, you know, mix, uh, reverb time. You can you know, make a few changes. Um, the IR1, the full version of IR1, gives you all sorts of parameters. Um, you can go nuts with that. You can, you know, have custom cur EQ curves for the damping, you know, how quickly the different frequency ranges decay according to whatever um, reverb you've got going. Uh, you can change all sorts of stuff. You can see I'm doing kind of a, you know, uh, this is not un just a normal plate going on. Um, in fact, I've got, now I've got the guitar tracks sending over to this reverb. They're all on the send here. So you can hear the uh, reverb tail on on that. Uh, here it is without. So it, you know, it gives you a nice kind of space for the uh, guitars. Another thing I'm doing to keep the the mix clean is putting a you know this uh, volume curve on there. So I'm really kind of cutting the tail off. I mean, the, for the most part, you can hear it decay, but then it just kind of gets out of the way. And in the mix, it does quite a bit for the guitars. So here's uh, without it. Never stop asking. And with it. Never. So let me go to the top without the vocals. With. So, you know, again, it's not something that's real over the top, but it gives you, uh, you know, just gives the guitars a little more kind of authority there. They're, uh, you know, hitting a room pretty hard because uh, these were all either either direct uh, or close mic'd on amps. Uh, I didn't have any, uh, didn't do any room miking on the guitars on this track. Um, and the last plugins I'm going to cover here are the, the GTR plugins. Um, now they're kind of very special case, you know, you think just use them on guitars, but, uh, they actually, you know, there's no reason why you can't use them on other tracks, and I have quite a bit. Um, on this track, I am using uh, the guitar amp. On the um, this guitar, let me bypass it. This is the original track. Oh, just a little bit of stuff going on. Um. Actually, I wonder if, I don't think that's the, uh... Hmm. Yeah. The original track, a little brighter, a little pickier, and so I'm using the guitar amp, but just a clean amp, but I'm just kind of changing the tone. I wanted something a little, uh, a little thicker. Um, you can go totally over the top. In fact, I just did a remix uh, of a song for for somebody where I had two guitar tracks and I wanted more distortion. And one was kind of a dirty track, and I dropped GTR on it and just got a huge, you know, high gain kind of in your face sound. Um, the uh, um, GTR also has 
uh, stomp. They're uh, a whole series of um, of essentially modeled stomp box uh, effects. They're um, um, kind of specific to guitar, but you know I've used them on other uh, other tone other tracks as well. Um, they can be a uh, you know, if you're looking for some uh, inspiration and trying to, you know, some track is not doing something for you, you know, throw some stomp box effects on it and you can, uh, you know, have some fun with that. Uh, well, that pretty much covers what I was going to uh, go over about specific uh, plugins. Uh, now, uh, let's, uh, I can take some questions here. Let me uh, see what uh, see if I can answer some questions. See what uh, you guys are interested in. Okay, uh, Muhammad Ayers asks, "What's the best way to use reverb with delays? Should I put the reverb before the delay or vice versa?" Um, typically, I would sometimes I run them in parallel, have delays and reverbs because uh, they're doing different things. Um, I have used, actually I've used them all three configurations. If you put the delay before the reverb, you'll get a little more of a, a little more space between the original signal and, and the effects, because then each tap, each echo on the delay is going to get some reverb. Um, doing it the other way around, it's going to make it sound bigger and washier, because uh, you're going to be echoing the reverb. So it just kind of depends on what kind of sound you're going for. Um, see, Lucas is asking, what is your favorite pop lead vocal effect? Um, I mean, aside from compression, uh, you know, compression on a lead vocal and pop to bring it really up front is, uh, is huge. Um, I do like super tap, um, you know, doing a little bit of delay like that. Uh, sometimes chorus can be real nice to make it jump out. Uh, it kind of depends on how dense the track is. Um, you know, the more that's going on, the more I'll probably put on there uh, to try to make it pop. Uh, Tim is asking, what are good sounding natural reverb settings for lead vocals? Um, it depends somewhat on the context of the song. Uh, you don't want to, you know, typically if you want to make it sound like it's a band playing, you don't want to put the reverb in a cathedral and have the guitars in a, you know, small room. Um, you know, plate reverbs uh, sound really nice in guitars and uh, can also sound good on vocals. Um, I almost always tailor the, the size and the reverb time to kind of sit right in the track. Uh, but if it's uh, anything that's, you know, anything up-tempo, I tend to use a little shorter reverbs. You know, the slower, more you know, open it is, uh, you can use longer stuff and it sounds good. Uh, Greg is asking, do you typically put reverb on the overall mix? And if so, uh, on the submaster or master track? Uh, you know, I almost never use reverb on an entire mix. Uh, it tends to be a kind of a mess. Uh, when I do mastering, there are uh, times when I do use a reverb and I'll use, um, uh, an impulse response and use a very small room like you know like the studio settings if you get a real nice studio impulse and you just mix in a little bit of that I mean just a tiny bit uh, and if it, especially if it's a track you know in mastering where there's a bunch of individual tracks that have been mixed together um, to um, uh, that need to sound like it's a band happening but it's not quite coming through you know, a little bit just a tiny bit can help kind of glue that together but uh it's a pretty rare occurrence uh lewis m is asking what reverb type to use on background vocals a uh, hall room or plate um when i do use a uh, uh, reverb on um on background vocals i tend to go with a, a longer um thing not uh I mean, if you want the background vocals to sound kind of up front and just right there, uh, room sounds good because it just has a little more intimate sound and the early reflections. Uh, but if it's more of a you know big background vocals and you want it to fill up the mix, um, you know, 
plates and, and hulls can do a, a good job with that. Um, often when I do that too, I'll use either put an EQ after the reverb, or if the reverb has its own control for uh, for dampening, you know, rolling off the low end, I'll do that because because that can really kind of muck things up too. Uh, too much low end in the reverb, and the high end, you'll still get the the sound of the um, you know of the room coming through over the rest of the mix. Uh, Adrian is asking, do you use other effects for vocals or just reverb and delays? Uh, you know, uh, pretty much I'll use, um, you know, chorus, flange, doubling, uh, the, you know, really whatever, uh, w whatever works. Uh, in fact, this remix I just finished up, um, I had two lead vocals, so I mixed one, one was a main vocal, you know, kind of EQ'd and set up, and and in fact, on and this particular thing, I didn't use any effects on the vocals. It was uh, kind of an electronic, um, kind of a you know Trent Reznor kind of remix vibe. So I had one real up front dry, and I had the other one. I actually used, uh, I think I used GTR on it, and actually you know, distorted it and compressed the heck out of it, and just mixed it in underneath it, and it gave it a really nice nice tone. So. I know nothing's real off, you know, off limits as far as effects and vocals go. Um, see, Clem, uh, do you put reverb on drums? All drums are just some of the pieces of drums. Uh, yeah, that's a good one. Um, often, um, you know, the, uh, the snare would be the typical one. You can put some reverb on that, and. That gives you, you know, there's some bleeding happening on the snare from the other tracks. Uh, so just putting reverb on the snare, if just to give it more space, can can help out. Um, if you if I've got decent uh, overhead or room mics, if I want a little more reverb off, and I'll just put some uh, compression. Maybe you do some parallel compression with uh, um, like the hybrid compressor does. In fact, that's what I'm using on on this tune. Uh, and actually, in this case, I'm using the hybrid compressor on the on the submix in the entire kit, and doing a, a mix to mix in some compressed sound with the main one. Um, as far as reverb goes, one of the things I do tend to avoid is putting reverb on the kick, because that again just creates all this low frequency mush that can you know cause the the, the mix to lose definition. Um, so sometimes just the maybe the toms and the snare, sometimes most of the kit, but rarely the kick. Uh, Carlos L. is asking, is it better to use effects as inserts on the original channel or as sends to have a clean and affected channel apart? I always do that. Um, it depends. Um, I do reverbs. Um, pretty much always as sends. Uh, I often will set up a delay on a send. Um, but for uh, I I don't shy away from using inline uh, plugins. Uh, you have the mix control, so you always have control of whether how much wet and dry signal there is. Uh, if you're bringing effects in and just automating, bringing them in at certain sections of the song, it's probably better to have that on a send because then you can just automate the send up and down as you uh, as you see fit. Uh, that's a little more difficult to do. You'd have to automate the the level within the uh, the plugin, uh, so it's not um, not too bad. Uh, let's see another question: When using room microphones for guitar or drums that was recorded using a small room, do you reinforce the room with delays and reverb to large? Uh, sure. Yeah, that's um, adding reverb to reverb. Um, Sometimes that's uh, really what you need to make that uh, to make it sound right, um, and it's a, it's amazing. Yeah, don't get too caught up on what something sounds like when it's soloed. Um, it's all about how it works in the mix, you know. And if you solo it and you go, that sounds like a mess, but then in the mix it actually puts it in the right space, then it that's the right thing to do. Uh, Lewis. Again, is asking, how do you add depth using delays? Are they mono or stereo? Um, if you want to give you know depth, it's uh, I would always go with a stereo. And like, uh, well, you saw in the the two delay examples that I had going here, got 
the taps pan hard left and right, the volume down a little bit, and, um, and maybe some filtering going on. And that kind of puts a, the lead vocal here, or then you know, the, the original sound here, and the other ones kind of on the edges, and it that really is what gives you the depth. With mono, you don't get as much of that depth kind of sound. Mono delays are, and other effects can be really cool too. Uh, you want to be careful not to go too crazy with stereo stuff. If everything is stereo, then you know you know you're not going to hear anything. You know, it's, so it's it's good to have have your uh, your stereo field be varied. Uh, another question: What effects do you use to get darker delays on vocals, like in today's pop music? Um, you know, you could use uh, you know. It's really just EQing the, uh, uh, EQing the, uh, the taps, like with, uh, I was doing with, uh, Super Tap. Um, you can go in here and you can do a, a low pass filter. So you could have these set up. So that, uh, and oh, it's in the chorus. Yeah. In any case, um, let me get back to the questions, but you can use, uh, you know, the, the filters in here, or if you have the, um, the, uh, delay set up on a send, then you just, you know, can put a filter, put an EQ after the uh, the delay, to EQ it however you like. Um, how should I EQ reverb? Should I concentrate more on the low end? Um, like most of these questions, it, it's kind of context dependent. Um, if it's a up tempo song, a dense mix, I really kind of shy away from the low end on reverbs because uh, there's generally so much going on that it's you know just become you know. It, you don't really hear it so much, and it just becomes more of a mess. Uh, if it's a, you know, more sparse arrangement, lower tempo song, you know, there's more room to to allow for that. Uh, it kind of it depends mostly on what you want the EQ to do, or what what you want the reverb to do. Whether you want it to make it sound like it, you know it has a lot of weight in a very large room, then the low end is going to be important. Uh, if it's more just kind of putting some space on it, you know, the high end is where you're going to cue off of uh, for that kind of sound. Uh, Josh is asking, uh, what is your favorite way of utilizing flanges and choruses? Um, well, I pretty much always use those uh, just in line because you have control over the mix because um, I find it a little bit, you know, hard to control if you're sending multiple tracks to the same flanger or chorus you know, the balance between the, the send level and the, you know, it, it's just easier and they, they take so little processing that it's, um, you know, I, I find it's better just to, uh, just to put them in line. Uh, and doing, a, um, you know, just setting the mix, you know, it's, um, if you want, you know, a total, uh, you know, in your face effect, then obviously, you know, more of a, you know, closer to 50, 50, uh, something subtle, you can just back that down until it sounds right in the mix and, uh, just keep, you know, bypass it, you know, take it in and out when you're, uh, setting it up to see whether you, uh, you know, it's doing what you want in the mix. Let's see, Scott is asking when listening to a mix, how do you decide where to begin when applying effects? Um, my, Basic, uh, the way I approach a mix is uh, uh, kind of like uh, in the old days as far as, um, you know, you got tape and analog board, you know, I'll just play the song and then just start moving faders. You know, I'll just start with, uh, you know, just positioning things, you know, getting getting a, a good rough mix together. Um, probably the next step is I'll, I'll start EQing, you know, if I need more or less of something. Um, I almost always go through and, and check tracks that shouldn't have any low end. And if they've got some junk going on there, I'll just 
you know, EQ that out. Uh, and then at that point, I kind of start thinking about uh, effects and insert, uh, start deciding, you know, what, what I want to do as far as emphasizing or de-emphasizing something or adding a particular effect. Um, and then the last thing I do is get into automation. Um, so it's, uh, you know, kind of a combination of uh, if I need a track to do something more in a mix, I'll add, um, you know, I might use an effect for that. Um, and sometimes it's just an overall where I want the mix to go. Um, let's see. Uh, Gerald is asking, are these relevant to hip hop? Um, yes and no. I mean, there's a pretty big range of what's out there uh, with hip hop. Um, the, um, you know, a lot of vocals in hip hop tend to be a little more, uh, a little drier. Um, but then you got the singing sections where it's more of a, you know, just pop sensibilities, uh, if you've got that kind of thing going on. Um, so yes, I know. I mean, you can really just, you can kind of listen to what's, uh, what's been done and there's a, a pretty interesting array of, uh, of applications out there. Um, see, when stacking vocal tracks, do you use the same effect on all tracks or different effects? Um, if I want it to glue together, then I'll use the same effects. Um, sometimes I, I want them to sound, you know, to have different spaces. Uh, but I'd say more often than not, if I'm going to add some reverb to uh, backing vocals, I'll put them all in the same, the same space essentially. Uh, Cesar is asking, do you use any kind of compression, uh, compressor or limiter after delay or reverb to maintain levels and better control for mixing? Um, the only time I really use uh, compressors and limiters after a delay is when I really want to emphasize the effect. Uh, if you uh, if you really want to you know, make the, that effect really up front and obvious, you can kind of, you know, hit it real hard with a compressor and, you know, you'll end up hearing a lot more until it, com you know, goes away completely. Uh, so really more for, for a special effect than anything else. Now, I found that if you get the compression and the levels right on the, on, on the vocal track or on whatever track you're doing, the reverb and delays will just follow along with that. Uh, Clem is asking, do you use reverbs, delays, or other effects on bass? Because uh, he didn't show us any effects on bass. Um, actually, in this tune, I'm using the... Uh, uh, I'm not using any effects on the bass other than I've got the uh, API 2500 and then the uh, Kramer EQ. Uh, I tend not to use reverb too much on bass because uh, it because of the mud issue. Uh, I do sometimes use a chorus on bass, um, and actually sometimes when I do that, I'll do that uh, on ascend. So then I can put a uh, I can put an EQ after the chorus to roll off the bottom end. Because uh, the chorus, especially on bass, and you're going to get that phase cancellation as the signal, um, you know, as it sweeps through the, the center point, um, and that's really bad on bass. You're going to, in fact, you, you can see there's uh, bass-specific stomp boxes out there. You know, actual, you know, like Boss and stuff that have bass-specific effects that do that type of thing. Um, so you just want to be real careful not to screw around with the phase on the low end. Uh, but adding a little bit of, uh, you know, chorus or flange on the upper end of the bass can make it kind of stand up and jump out of the mix more. So if that's what you need, that's, uh, uh, and I'm not afraid to, to give that a shot. Um, Carlos, how do you make your choice between true verb, ren verb, or IR1? Uh, you know, between True Reverb and Renaissance Verb, I pretty much always go with Renaissance Reverb. It's just, um, to me, it sounds like it's it's a better algorithm, um, sounds smoother, um, but you know, they're kind of similar. Um, Renaissance Reverb is kind of along the lines of, you know, 
uh, traditional like lexicon uh, reverbs that uh, where it's it's code that kind of model or emulates what a room does. It's not exactly what a room does, but it does some really cool stuff. Uh, if I want something to sound like a real room, um, that's where IR1 comes in because you just get the snapshot of the actual space. Um, and I don't use IR1 as much in a pop or rock uh, mix because uh, there's there's certain things that uh, that are in a real room that are not necessarily good for clarity in a mix where Renaissance Reverb, you have a little more control over things and it's kind of tailored to making reverb sound that sounds good in a mix. Um, Josh is asking, what is your favorite way of working with flanges and choruses? Well, there's, um, pretty much always use them in line. Um, I do like, uh, um, yeah, I don't know if I have a favorite way. It's, um, um, uh, you know, the occasion I'll, I'll use a flange, you know, flange in particular kicking in on a section just for effect. Um, you know, and then it requires a little automation or taking that chunk of audio, splitting it to another track and just throwing the, uh, the effect on that track only. Um, which is sometimes easier than messing with the automation. Uh, George is asking, uh, which Waves plugin would you use to emulate an Eventide H3000 micro pitch shift? Hmm. Actually, I used to have an H3000, and it does a huge amount of uh, interesting things. But the micro pitch shift, um, yeah, the doubler, doubler gets pretty close to that. Um, yeah, I'd say you know probably probably the doubler because it because uh, that the I, if it's the H three thousand patch you're, that I think you're talking about, it's the one where it just kind of detunes up and down slightly left and right, um, and that's pretty solidly in the in the what what doubler is capable of. Um, let's see, I've got a question: How do you use PAS when you mix? Yeah, the um, you've noticed that I've got. Uh, has meter up here going um, and I pretty much I, I put it on the master fader and just let it ride um, it's uh, when looking at the entire mix yeah, it's, it's kind of useful to see how your stereo field is going but I probably use it more for um, just looking at soloing tracks So you can see, uh, in particular, when you've got junk going on down at the bottom that you might want to uh, to cut off. Like on this tune, on the chorus, I've got, I'm using the uh, CLA-76 on the lead vocal, and I've got it in uh, all button mode, which does a pretty crazy, just over the top uh, compression. but I found that it also created um, a lot of uh, low end. Like if I ba bypass the CQ, never stop asking. So you can see here down at 16 hertz, there's like as much. Why? You know, there's a huge amount of energy going on down here, which is really not contributing to the vocal sound in the mix. So that's why I'm following that up with uh, Q4. And I stacked a couple of uh, high-pass filters. If you if you put two filters on the same point, you get a little sharper cutoff. So with that engaged, yeah. never stop asking. The sound of the vocal doesn't change, but all this real low-frequency energy goes away. Um, it's harder to hear that junk down there. So that's uh, I find pass really useful for that when, when a track is soloed so you can you know see the stuff that you're not necessarily hearing unless you have like really well tuned uh, subs and even then you have to solo it because in the mix it's just going to become part of the the whole the whole thing uh, Lucas is asking do you like to feed different effects into each other uh, 
yeah, sometimes, um, you know, it's get a little more, uh, you know, in a, you know, kind of more mainstream mix. Um, not, uh, not so much, but, uh, you, if you're doing things, trying to, you know, create an ambience or, you know, some kind of interesting space or do something, you know, chaining effects, um, you know, I'll run a, a number of things in line on an insert and, um, uh, that does, uh, you can get some really cool, uh, stuff going on. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to take one more question here. And Paul Shields is asking, what is your opinion, you know, what, in your opinion, is the best starting Waves bundle? Um, it kind of depends on the, uh, um, on your budget. Um, there, uh, in fact, I'd have to, uh, here, let me see. So I've got, uh, got my, uh, uh, refresh myself on what's, uh, You see the uh, you know gold. Gold is pretty nice. I mean that covers all the basic bases. I mean you get a little bit of the model plugins because uh, in version eight they added uh, the uh, V EQ to the gold bundle, which was kind of nice. That used to be uh, in one of the upper bundles, but uh, they migrated that back down. So you've got, um, you know, some nice EQ, uh, you get limiter, uh, deesser, hybrid compressor is great, um, and you pretty much get a pretty wide range of effects. Um, you know, platinum, I mean, for mixing, I would say uh, gold is good. I do like the, uh, the Quig Tech. Um, stuff, but platinum adds more, um, more effects that you might use in, um, in, uh, mastering, but gold is good. Uh, you know, Mercury's great. Uh, probably my favorite of Waves model plugins are the APIs. Uh, those just sound stellar on, on drums. Uh, but I think if you got the money for gold, that would be, uh, that covers a lot of the bases and, uh, get a lot of work done with that. Um, the, uh, you can find more information about uh, me and the book on uh, my website, uh, otherroom.com, and also uh, wavesbook.otherroom.com. In fact, all the tracks in the, uh, uh, the, the song I was playing, that's the, the song I produced for the book, all the individual tracks are available there for download, so you can play with them yourself, as, as well as all the uh, plug-in presets that I use in the book. Uh, it really is a companion to the book. You can run through each chapter, load up the plugins, drop in the, uh, you know, load up the presets, and hear exactly what I'm talking about in there. Uh, with Waves, you can do a, a two-week demo of everything. So you can uh, um, spend a little time and really get a good feel for how, you know, what each plugin does and, you know, how you like it, you know, what it sounds like, and uh, would help in deciding what uh, what plugins you might want to use. Uh, and one other thing I want to mention, uh, NAM Show is this next week, as many of you might know. Uh, and uh, one of my uh, little fun hobby projects is the NAM Oddities. Uh, I've been, uh, I don't know, 14 years? I don't know. I've, I've Basically, I go to the show and look for the uh, the strange things that uh, that show up at NAM and uh, write them up, put them up on a, on a website. Uh, and there's some really interesting things up there. Um, so um, I'll be uh, at NAM this year, wandering around, and uh, you know, a couple weeks after NAM, I should have uh, the the new oddities pages up. Uh, so I'd like to. Uh, Thank everyone for, uh, for tuning in, and those were uh, some great questions, um, and uh, thanks. 
That concludes our webinar for today. Thank you, Barry, and thank you all for taking part. We hope you enjoyed it. If you want to go back and view this webinar again, we will have it on our website, waves.com, within the next few weeks, where you can also find more information about any of the plugins Barry discussed and download free demos. Also be sure to look out for our upcoming webinars on a variety of topics. You can view previous ones right now by going to this link that I'm putting in the chat. That's the same link where you'll find this webinar in the next week or so. We'll also send a message to everyone who registered for this webinar, letting you know when the video is ready for viewing. If you're interested in more information about the interactive book, Waves Plugins Workshop, Mixing by the Bundle, please visit sound.org, which I'm also putting a link to in the chat now. Okay, that's it. Thanks again, Barry, and thank you all for attending. Have a great day, and we hope to see you at the next one.